When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important, Not Important, a fun special episode in partnership with our friends over at Inverse. My name is Quinn Emmett. And my name is Brian Colbert Kennedy. Uh, And this uh, is the podcast where we give you the tools you need to fight for a better future for everyone. And today, that definitely starts with you. Uh, The context, we give you that, uh, straight from the smartest people on earth, and the action steps you can take to support them and support yourself yourself especially Mm -hmm. with this episode Mm -hmm. yes our Mm -hmm. guests uh, are scientists they're doctors and nurses journalists engineers farmers politicians uh activists educators business leaders astronauts uh even a reverend early on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we got one of the most diverse shows in science folks uh and we are damn proud of it uh this is your friendly reminder that you can send questions uh thoughts feedback chocolate to us on twitter at important not imp or you can email us uh, at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. That's important, not imp on Twitter. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. You can also join tens of thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. That's right. Uh, Brian, this week's episode is about you, dear listeners. No, not you. I mean, there's a little bit about you, uh, probably sure. more than more than necessary, um, <laughs> but it's about everybody out there. Uh, and Brian, our guest is coming again to us uh, from Inverse.com and also their wonderful podcast, uh, Abstract, which we've uh, talked about before and we've linked to in our newsletter. Uh, her name is Ali Patillo. And uh, right. Brian, Brian, there's not uh, a lot of journalists out there who do a better job of sussing out the most vital truths in today's science news. And then um, also explaining them in a way that's uh, both digestible and also still uh, practical where necessary and and essential. All of those are difficult things to do uh, on their own, much less to do them all together on a continual yeah. basis. And uh, she's doing it on some of the most important things out there. So uh, we're really excited to have her on the show today. She kills it. It was an awesome conversation. I'm very excited for everybody to hear it. Absolutely. Um, all right. Let's go talk to Allie. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Our guest today, finally, now that I've got my shit together, is Ali Patillo. Uh, And together, we are going to really dig in, folks, uh, and ask you, how are you feeling? Uh, Ali, welcome again for the second time. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me, guys. Happy to be here. Uh Uh huh. Still, somehow, <laughs> I like that we're not uh, that we're just totally digging into the issue that we just said, not ignoring it and making it sound great for the cust- for the listener, but just really, really pointing it out. Yeah, um, right. We recorded ten minutes and I didn't yeah. record. Please. Continue. Anyways, um, Allie, please uh, let uh, our cust- or our listeners, Jesus, I work at a restaurant. Our listeners know uh, uh, who you are and and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I am a health and science reporter at Inverse, which is a news outlet based in New York City. Um, We cover entertainment, health science, technology, innovation. um, And specifically, I cover everything to do with the mind and body. Um, So looking at kind of the breaking scientific discoveries, new cancer treatments, um, cutting through kind of misinformation and looking at things like metabolism boosters or these kind of miracle cures that you see online to figure out whether that's actually a real thing and kind of help people make really sound evidence-based decisions about their body. I also co-produced the Abstract podcast, which tells all of Inverse's kind of weirdest and most wonderful stories in sound three times a week. 
Thank you for doing all of that again. It is so interesting what you're doing. I love that it's evidence-based. And and uh, folks, where we left off when I realized I wasn't recording this wonderful conversation was uh, Allie had been describing that she basically debunks all of the things that Brian buys online. So <laughs> right. Uh, right. you were asking specifically, uh, Brian, I believe about metabolism boosters and Allie was just like, no. I got quite a list here. Things yeah. that I've purchased. Yeah. I think the supplement world, I mean, we've seen as kind of like the wild, wild west. It's not yeah. actually regulated for safety or efficacy by the FDA. Um, so a lot of times what you're seeing online makes these really crazy claims like you're gonna have increased vitality, so much energy, you're gonna drop 50 pounds. Um, mm-hmm. and the research just for the most part isn't necessarily there to support those claims. You know, when you're talking about metabolism, exercise is probably the best way to keep it running smoothly. Um, but these kind of um, miracle cures or like these drinks or shakes that you see, they're not going to do as much as, you know, just going to the gym and working out what. Right. Eat a salad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it really is. And again, this is not the topic for today, but like, it. well, I mean, people are looking for for fixes and cures and help in a lot of ways. Um, and this is just the disclaimer to say that, yeah, I mean, that shit is literally t- entirely unregulated. We had a great conversation with uh, Greg Renfrew, who's the CEO of Beauty Counter, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and uh, about basically like, what are you putting on your body and in your body? Yeah. And uh, I was not aware uh, that th- there, Brian, what was it like? The last the last regulation about uh, like bodily products was in uh, for things that go on your body was like 1934 or something like that. It's just, yeah, I mean, wow. it's, it's, it's There's horrifying. There's just no laws, right? It's it's bonkers. No yeah. laws. Uh, everything's going fine. Um, <laughs> everything's great. Uh, hey, quick reminder for everyone: our goal uh, today and every time we do this is to uh, provide some context for our our topic today or our question. How are you feeling? Mm-hmm. And then uh, dig into some action oriented uh, questions. Um, and uh, what everyone out here uh, and out there can do about uh, what's going on. Yeah, which is a lot. Does that sound yeah. good, Allie? Are you, are you still in great. for this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, um, Quinn, let us know when we have to stop and start again because you haven't yes. been recorded. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Don't worry. I think we're we've got go three for three. <laughs> uh, Allie, we like to start with one important question to set the tone for this fiasco. Uh, instead of saying, tell us your entire life story, even though you were telling us some of that ahead of time and it sounded fantastic, um, we like to ask, Ali, why are you vital to the survival of the species? <laughs> it's a big question, but mm-hmm, be honest. Yeah, no, I mean, I've obviously thought about this a lot, like every single human on the planet has. And I think that as a journalist, my job is to help people make sense of the world and sometimes even escape it. Um, so a lot of my job, as we kind of touched on, is breaking down really complicated and confusing messages from scientists, from politicians, um, kind of breaking down, you know, the news to help people figure it out and how it applies to their life and figure out ways um, to just live better and happier and healthier. Um, And I think that this is really vital because, you know, a lot of scientists are incredibly busy actually conducting clinical research or doctors are really busy treating patients And they don't always succeed at translating their insights and findings in a way that people understand. Um, And what happens then is that journalists or even just lay people in the public, um, they kind of jump to conclusions, they misinterpret, they make something a bigger deal than it needs to be. um, And that can have really dire consequences. So my role is to kind of bridge that gap between these people doing amazing work that often seems impossible to understand and, you know, the public and help them kind of navigate this just ocean of mixed messages about their health. And as we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic, this is more important than ever because people's, you know, lives, their health, their economic well-being is all on the line. I mean, it, it, it really, like you said, it, it's never what you do and you do so well. Uh, it, it has never been more more vital than it is now. So th- thank you for just Put, putting that out there and and for doing it every day. I mean, there's this, and, and we'll get into this. We've run into this. It, it, we all joke like everyone's an epidemiologist now, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and no one no one knew what that word was on like March 14th, but on March 15th, we knew we we all had like playing cards for the top 20 epidemiologists in the country, right? Um, right. But but well, what these scientists are trying to do, which is really wild, uh, this year, uh, like was never really meant to be sort of exposed to the day-to-day of social media mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. because science is this 
inherently complex and and two one step forward, seven steps back, three steps for a hundred steps forward, forty. You know, it's, right. it's, it's it's crazy. And and the entire point, and this is the hardest thing for 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 especially I think Americans to wrap their head around, um, is is the entire point of science is to constantly doubt your convictions mm -hmm. and to and to prove yourself wrong. Like mm -hmm. that's what gets scientists out of bed every morning. And that is just not what people are looking for right now. So um uh, uh, you know I, I think it's so vital to have someone like you and people like uh, you know Ed Young and Helen Branswell that are out there and, and are both schooled in this uh and schooled in how science works and the best way to translate it to people because like you said the ocean of misinformation but also just information that isn't ready for the light of day yet or yeah, isn't absolutely. ready for the regular people is is hard and that makes it hard on people um when we're all locked inside so thank you for that i i, I want to now basically establish some context which i don't think is going to be an, i don't think any of this is going to be a surprise for people but today is going to be you know none of us are specific professionals in any of these categories we're going to talk about i mean you definitely have the most experience sort of from from a meta point of view of of diving into all these things over and over with, with everything you cover. But mm -hmm. um, it's important to understand that everybody is dealing with something right now. And, and we all, this is not a knock, but no one really seems to be dealing with it well. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That is okay. So let me just kind of go down the list. And this is going to seem sad, but again, the point is like, we're all in this. Let's, we have to be real about what's going on, which mm -hmm. is in March, right? Which, uh, to be clear, it was like a thousand actual years ago. <laughs> uh, a, a study dropped that said, again, this was March, 24% of respondents had serious depression symptoms and 50% had at least mild symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those numbers are triple the usual percentages. Three times as many people checking some of the depression symptoms box. That was in March. That was, joking aside, six months ago, mm -hmm. right? Um but it is also too important. It's important to, to remember that for a lot of folks, like shit didn't just get hard in March when all everyone went inside, right? right Millions right. of Americans and people around the world have been suffering increasingly on the daily for a very long time from, I mean, deep breath, devastating inequality, racism, low wage jobs, pre existing conditions, uh, uh, loneliness, domestic abuse, urban heat, climate change, uh, toxic environments, lack of healthy food, homelessness, uh, PTSD, right? The, the list goes on and on. And, and of course, since then, we're all now united by this one thing uh, where things have gotten real with COVID. And we've all been locked up or been asked to be locked up in one way or another. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a rudder at the ship, uh, leadership wise, at least in the US, um, in places like. France and Spain. Again, we're recording on, on September 11th of all days during, uh, by the way, national, I couldn't quite narrow it down online. It, it appears to be national suicide awareness day, week, and month, which mm -hmm. is all great. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take it. But the point is there's a lot going on. COVID is raging back in, in, in France and in Spain. Uh, Madrid is a nightmare again. Fires are raging everywhere. In, in, the, pa in the past few years, Something like 60,000 farmers in northern India ha have been killing themselves because mm, of climate-related mm -hmm, issues. Mm -hmm. um, the suicide rate in England and Wales is the highest it's been in 20 years for men. Hurricane Laura, which I think a lot of people have forgotten about, basically destroyed Louisiana in the middle of a pandemic last week and then followed it up with a crushing heat wave. Gun sales are double year over year from last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans bought an estimated 12 million guns from March to August this year. Okay, across all suicide attempts not involving a firearm, four percent result in death. That's without a firearm. Uh, Ninety percent of gun suicide attempts end in death. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. anyways, if you want to hear more about a uh, fight for gun control, we just had an incredible conversation with Fred Guttenberg uh, just before this, uh, which gets into this a little bit. He obviously is very close to this. Um, a CDC response report from August, now getting a little more recent, surveyed 100,000 Americans and said that one in four respondents in the 18 to 24-year-old range had considered suicide in the month prior. Mm -hmm. One in four Americans, 18 to 24. Um, the suicide rate for young people has grown every year since 2007. Um, poor mental health symptoms are massively elevated among frontline workers and caregivers 
And, and you are feeling it, listeners, and I am certainly feeling it, and Brian is, and Ali is, and we are the lucky ones. We can do most of our job from our Zooms. Um, Brian couldn't do all of his job from a Zoom, and he got fucking COVID, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he, and he's one of the lucky ones. Um, but there is, there are options, and there's hope on the horizon, and there's options for you and, and for the people who are depending on and the people you love. Um, there are suicide and self-harm hotlines now and, and text lines and groups and there's climate action and there's telehealth options now and there's mushrooms. And we're going to get into a lot of that today with uh, this incredible intrepid reporter who's sh- sharing her time with us. But uh, again, I want to be clear, none of us are mental health professionals. Uh, that wasn't actually the point today. But I think what's going to be helpful is to take a really meta look at this landscape, which is everybody now, and and then... Eventually, we'll we'll do some more deep dives with some of the subject experts on these things where appropriate. But again, it's important that, like so much of what we talk about here, we understand like the generalist perspective is is important, the systems thinking, which is that so many of these things and these symptoms and these causes are linked together. And Mm -hmm. we really need to all try when we can and when we feel good about it to take a step back and understand those mechanisms. And it's not just so we make better policy. It's also so you don't feel so fucking alone out there, Mm -hmm. folks, right? We are isolated from one another, but we are in at least this one thing together. So uh, Ali has written extensively about mental health over at Inverse, and and so we're grateful she's here today. Um, And we're going to talk about the big question. How are you feeling? Um, So uh, Ali, let's start with you, or I'll go first. I I don't care. Whatever whatever works. Ali, how are you feeling? I am feeling all right. I'm feeling okay. Um, I think the past few months have been a roller coaster of emotions, like it has been for everyone. Um, I think for me, particularly being so embedded in the news cycle, you know, filtering through thousands of headlines every day, feeling like, and I think a lot of people share this feeling, like you're constantly careening on the edge of a cliff, you know, and you're just about to fall over and you're holding on as tightly as you can. But it just seems like crisis after crisis after crisis, um, both, you know, in personal life and just in the world we're living in. Um, And I think, I mean, as you mentioned, people were feeling mental illness and um, negative mental health symptoms long before the pandemic um, emerged. But the pandemic has exacerbated and heightened all those things, amplified them, um, and completely transformed, you know, every part of our lives. You know, people are now dealing with lost jobs, lost lives of loved ones. They're feeling disconnected from friends because they can't see people as much as they used to. Their r- routines are a mess. You know, they're working from home. They're not in their office. Parents are dealing with teaching their kids. I mean, all of this takes an enormous toll on our brains and in turn our bodies. And it's kind of foolish to imagine that we could operate normally in this really abnormal time. So I think that that's a long answer to your question, but I think like everyone, I'm feeling an extremely complicated mix of emotions and just trying to take things day by day, week by week. And remember that even though sometimes it feels like the world is ending, the world is not ending, at least not today. And, you know, there we can move forward and move through this. Thank you for being so candid about that. Yeah, that's uh, that feels about right. <laughs> and for your hope. Thank you for your hope. Yes, uh, uh, necessary. Uh, Brian, you want to go next or you want me to go? I feel fine. I feel pretty good. <laughs> feeling, feeling a little old. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, but that's all right. I can, I can fix that with, uh, you know, stretching. And <laughs> uh, I feel a little tired. But also very, uh, very lucky that I'm, you know, everything's pretty good. Things could be so much worse. Always try to take that angle uh, when I when I start to think about anything to complain about. Is hold on, you're doing pretty good compared to so many other people. So I'm I'm overall just just doing just fine. Thanks for asking, Quinn. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, your your work has been beside your work here has been on and off. Um, you you got COVID. Uh, you've been locked in. You and your you and your girlfriend both got it. So. It, we should minimize what it what it has no, been no, like. Sure. I, th- I also think it's important. Like, yes, so many people are well off, but I think just like we all need to tell ourselves, uh, give ourselves some self validation. Like, give yourself credit for what you've what you've been dealing with as well. You know, absolutely, totally agree. COVID sucked. Very glad it was uh, uh, not much, 
not much worse and that we didn't have to go to the hospital and, and, and all that crazy stuff. Uh, I'm over it. We're good. I just try to stay positive over here. I'm trying to keep that hope going, like Allie said. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you two haven't snuffed it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> How, How are you? Uh, how am I? That's a great question. That's a great question. Mm, I'm, I'm, uh-huh. you know, I'm up and down. Um, I've got, uh, I, I mean, I, 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 we try to do this on this show, but I, 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 as always, I'll say again, like Brian, you, you try to do it, and Ali, you as well. Like, I, I have enormous white straight male privilege in America. I, I mean, I, you know, I have three very healthy uh, children who have food, uh, who have the devices they need to do their remote schooling as much as it's a, di- a disaster. Um, and that's not anyone's f- fault. Uh, the teachers and school district are doing literally everything they can. Uh, their teachers are putting on, basically they, they turn on zoom to 25 kindergartners and basically put on like a five hour performance to yeah, keep these wow. kids attention. It is incredible. Um, and they're doing everything they can, but it's 50 different click things to click on. And it's six-year-olds and it's impossible and it's hard and they want to be in a classroom and they haven't seen other kids in six months and all these things. So I feel for them at the same time, they're thousands of times more resilient than, than certainly at least me. Um, it's incredible how well they have handled this entire thing for how long it's been going on. You know, work is hard and crazy and you try to, there are real deadlines and then there are deadlines you try to make up for yourself, which is part of running your own company. And also, uh, Ali, I think we discussed, you know, my, my day job is, is I'm a screenwriter, which is mm-hmm. always trying to make up your own deadlines unless you're in TV and you have real ones. Um, <laughs> with movies, you don't really have those until the very end. And usually, uh, yeah, the shit doesn't get made anyways. And certainly not now. Um, <laughs> but you do things like, oh, I got to turn this thing in. And then sometimes you sit back and you're like, I don't fucking know. Why? Like, what's what's mm-hmm. the point? What's the point? Um, I have the world's greatest manager in writing and, and he is always like, we're going to do this. And I mean, he, he basically like lives and dies by the phrase, like, you know, Goonies never, uh, uh, Goonies never say die. Goonies never say uh, die. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and has been that way throughout our whole relationship. And I remember calling him like a week ago and he was like, it doesn't matter. And I was like, no, not you too. <laughs> <laughs> like you're the last one. And, uh, I don't know. It goes on and off, but Ali, you know, I feel like you in, in doing the newsletter, uh, you know, where we try to curate the most important science things uh, that happened, but also you probably missed because there's so much else going on from the most reputable places in the most objective way possible. And then pairing them with these like really reputable data-driven action steps that people can take. Uh, there are times, same thing, where, you know, it takes me a week to do this thing and to get it out and, and working on it that I just sit back and go like, I I, I am exposing myself to, to a lot of existential shit mm, uh, all mm-hmm. of the time and it is necessary and is by choice and a lot of people depend on it from us and there are times where I'm like, I don't know, I would rather not do this anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that can certainly get to me um, for sure. But again, I'm lucky to be able to administer self-care to myself and spend time with my healthy kids and to put food on my table and um, I try to keep those things in mind. Uh, as as much as I can. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, once people are able to, if they are able to, and it's okay if you can't, um, but we do have, a, a, you know, for instance, an election coming up. Um, uh, and so I think it is important for people to try to take a step back and think about how they're thinking about things, mm-hmm. right? Because Americans, mm-hmm. I mean, humans, you know, we got these lizard brains and we we operate in fight and flight and 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 uh, the future look uh, looks logistically and statistically different for boomers than it does uh, for someone like Greta Thunberg. You know, like uh, everything is different, and, but we have to think about how we're thinking about things. And and um, Ed Yong at the Atlantic wrote this tremendous piece recently again about how we need to reorient our thinking around COVID because that's part of where we've gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and you recently wrote a piece, Ali, about embracing uncertainty. Um, and and that's important because again, as we talked about a little bit, and I don't remember if it was during the fake recording or during the real one now, because um, <laughs> time is a flat circle. Um, embracing uncertainty, pursuing uncertainty is is basically what the pursuit of si- the, the science really is. That is the scientific method, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and COVID itself, the way it's portrayed in the media, um, the rise of science, social media, and bots, and poor messaging from the government. I mean, at best, it makes setting expectations really really difficult for mm-hmm. everybody. Am I going back to work? When are my kids going back to school? When is vaccine coming? When's a treatment coming? This one works, that one doesn't. So the world we're facing before COVID, I mean, the world we're facing now 
and over the next 10 years is more uncertain than it's ever been for, for more people than ever. And yet, I mean, we deal with uncertainty, uncertainty so, so poorly, right? Um, it's a hard one to get over, right? To be stoic, to admit you can only control what you can control. And even I have a very difficult time with that. So I wonder, Ali, now, all that said, if you can talk a little bit about uncertainty and everything you've learned about mental health and sort of this, at least this past year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uncertainty is hugely prevalent in our lives now. As you mentioned, it's been prevalent for decades, but with the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, we have more questions than we have answers. Um, And a lot of that is because the virus was a novel coronavirus meaning scientists didn't know much, relatively speaking, about it, how to treat it, what it looks like, how fast it spreads. And, you know, scientists around the world are racing to answer those questions, and they've gone leaps and bounds in understanding it. But we still have a lot we don't know. And unfortunately, I don't know isn't really an acceptable answer for a lot of people. I mean, human beings are evolutionarily embedded to look for perceived threats in the environment and often weight negative information or um, scary information, fear-inducing information, more than positive information. Um, And when we're scared and when we don't have an answer, we often jump to conclusions um, or we can, as you said, kind of venture into this lizard brain where we reduce these really complex, nuanced topics into kind of binary yes or no categories. And that's really dangerous. And it's interesting because throughout the pandemic, you know, we've seen this huge upswell of misinformation and conspiracy theories. And I've done some reporting on a bunch of different ones, but one in particular was about the 5G um, cell phone towers or cell towers. Yeah, Mm -hmm. which was just a theory that really caught fire. I mean, we had like celebrities like Woody Harrelson tweeting about it, millions of people thinking Mm. that this was the origin of the coronavirus. People were burning down cell towers. (sighs) Pretty crazy stuff. But it's interesting because when I spoke to psychologists who study conspiracy theories, they really stress the point that people who are buying into these ideas aren't crazy, that it's actually um, kind of a human tendency to want to create a story out of something when there are more questions than answers. And that is just something that I think we need to be really thoughtful about and intentional about, about the way that we're, we're perceiving the coronavirus and the pandemic and all the messages around it and the way that we're making decisions based on that. Um, and I think like one of the The best ways to do that is when you're feeling yourself um, kind of jumping to worst case scenario, feeling doomed, feeling hopeless. I think thinking rationally, if you can, or talking to, you know, a friend about this, about, okay, what are the facts here? What's actually going on? Um, Trying to get information from multiple different sources um, rather than take one headline or one story at face value. And this is an ongoing process because, you know, telling someone who's freaking out just to be calm and be rational isn't really productive at all. But if you can have these kind of grounding conversations in the midst of these really overwhelming emotions, then you can realize, okay, this is what's actually going on here. This is what I actually need to be worried about versus this is what everyone's telling me you need to be worried about. That seems right. I mean, they employ the buddy system (laughs) when Mm -hmm. going through reputable information. Certainly. And that's what's hard. I mean, every, you know, we, we put out this, the, the new, our newsletters weekly instead of daily for a reason, which is to really be able to take a step back and, and, and say like, hey, listen, the, this is the biggest shit that happened this week. And maybe you already saw this headline because now versus when we started, for instance, climate change was on the front page of the New York Times today. Mm-hmm. It's rarely in other places. So maybe you did see these things, right? They're hard to miss at this point. Um, but we're going to put them in there anyways. Um, and, and yet, Every day, the news cycle completely changes, and it's full of things that are important and reputable uh, and uh, things that don't fit those buckets or that are going to change again, like we talked about with science. So, you know, I, I empathize. It's, it's really hard, but, you know, we, they talk about doom scrolling, mm-hmm. um, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's first thing in the morning, which is a bad idea, or for the last thing you do at night, which is a bad idea. Also bad, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's not... It's not helpful. There's wonderful science communicators out there that are doing their best, but holy hell is it a a losing battle on on, on social media every day. Um, You know, so 
f- find those things. And I love that idea of like reaching out to a friend and whether it's scheduled or not and saying like, can we, can we try to sort this out? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. can, can we try, what, what have you seen? Where have I seen? What are people and places that we're going to decide like are our places to get reputable information from? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that feels really, that feels really practical. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think per this conversation, I think it's really important. I mean, I obviously want people to stay informed and be engaged in the news, you know, to their capacity, because that's what I do. And I like want to help educate people, get everybody on the same page about some of these topics, help people learn something new every day. But I also think it's incredibly crucial to actually just disengage from the news and kind of pay attention to how the news is making you feel. Because what we do know is that, you know, chronic stress makes you sick over time and contributes to various different diseases. Um, And it's really important, you know, the news can set off um, your stress response and your fight or flight response. Because sometimes if you're watching a video, you, your brain doesn't realize that what you're watching in the video isn't actually happening to you. Um, and you might be experiencing some degree of that stress response um, if you're watching something traumatic. Um, and over time, if you're watching these things, you know, if you're scrolling the news every 30 minutes or every hour, which sometimes it can feel like you need to do that, especially now because you're trying to you know, figure out how to live your life. Do I go to the grocery store? Do I go to this person's wedding? You know, how do I make these very basic decisions in a way that's safe? And the news can be a resource for that. But I think it's also just really important for people to set boundaries on that and put down their phone and go outside or, you know, have a meal without either talking about the news or having your phone next to you with news alerts. Um, I think that like in today's world, we get news updates on our phones all the time in a way that other generations just didn't. You know, they read the newspaper in the morning, maybe they watched the nightly news, um, but they didn't have this information coming in constantly in a way that can just make people really panicked um, and fearful. So I think that like breaking up the way or thinking intentionally about the way that you consume news is huge. I, yeah, I, I got, I mean, it seems to make a lot of sense again. Like we, you want people to, to, you want an informed populace again with whatever 50 days until the election or whatever it might be. But at the same time, like I have this wonderful therapist who talks a lot about um, me doing too much. Cause I have like 12 jobs and three kids and live on two coasts. Mm-hmm. Um, but he talks a lot about this idea that like you have your bandwidth basically like, it can't always, there needs to be a, 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 um, like a buffer between how much you're doing and what your actual max bandwidth is. Like it, it, you can't go to 11 every day, Mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't leave room for something really traumatic happening to you or someone you love or work thing or a child or, or whatever it might be. Um, and it feels the same way for, for news engagement and, or even taking action, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't do it all day, every day. And especially because there's so, so little of it that you can actually control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's hard, it's hard to take a break, although although it's necessary, but I always find it so hard. Yeah, maybe because of of the of it being so constant that you're just getting hit with with everything. It almost feels like uh, wrong or something. Or if you, if you put your phone away and you, and you, you know, don't look at the news for, for a half an hour. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, I mean, it is for for me in particular, you know, working day in and day out in the media world, like it's part of my job to stay just right. informed to the utmost degree. Um, and there's a lot I like love about that. You know, I think it like feeds your curiosity and I want to know what's going on in the world. Um, but on a minute to minute basis, you know, is it is it do I need to be scrolling to see what every news outlet is putting out, you know, every minute. I don't think so. And I also think that like, for me, it's been so crucial to like develop sustainable habits just to even get through the day or get through the week and do this job. Um, And I think a lot of journalists feel that way as well, because it can sometimes feel like you're kind of wading through a really tumultuous ocean of, of news. And it's not possible to stay updated on everything, especially in this environment, you know, news is being produced um, much more rapidly. I, I don't know what the, the numbers are, but I would imagine it's much more rapid than in other decades. And yeah. staying up to date on it just isn't, is impossible. So you have to find a way to do it in a way that's sustainable and doesn't just hijack your brain. Because as you guys are talking about, like if you are constantly vigilant and 
um, constantly reading these headlines and then talking to your friends about it or talking to your family about it, then going back to get the update, you are leaving very little time for you to reset, to heal your body, to sleep well, all the things that we know are good for your mental and physical health. Um, and you're just constantly in this state of fight or flight and chronic stress, which is just going to create so many problems down the line. But as you're saying, all this is easier said than done. You know, we do need this information. um, And, you know, you want to know what's happening. Yeah, I, I've 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 tried over the past since we started doing this a couple of years ago. I've I've tried to develop better habits about you know taking uh, shutting everything down at night and t- time in the morning and and not doing it on the weekends. And then it really felt validated when I read an interview with Rachel <laughs> with Rachel Maddow, who basically leaves the studio on Friday and drives like four hours to her farm in like rural Massachusetts, and essentially f- says like on the weekend unless there's a piece of news that requires me to go on to my show in like an emergency capacity. Like I'm completely disconnected. And I was like, yeah, holy shit. If she does Ah, all that, then like I can turn off my phone for 48 hours. Like it's like, it's not, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, like Mm -hmm. I I tried to really take something from that. Um, And it's funny. It drives my family a little crazy because, because, you know, we're all busy during the week and then on the weekend, somebody will bring something up and I'm like, Like, I'm not not doing it. I I can't. Incredible. Uh, um, uh, Allie, I'm, what am I, 36, Quinn? I don't know. Who, who uh, can know? And I feel, you know, eh, younger sometimes, mostly older. I got a weird back and leg thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. We we work with uh, these young activists all the time and, and learn from them and, you know, look around and, you know, it's not hard to see and to get why they're, they're suffering. And, you know, boomers, boomers won't share the same future that these kids will. And these kids are marching in the streets out of desperation. And then now some of them are considering suicide for for the same reason, desperation. Do you have thoughts on how we can help bend the arc in in the direction of action, of of helping these young people Mm -hmm. specifically Mm -hmm. feel uh, a sense of of possibility? Yeah, I think that's the kind of the golden question um, right now, because I think that what's happening is You know, in the past, parents would look at their children and they would think this child, I'm working so that this child has a better future than I did and a better life. And they've seen in different polls that this is the first generation where parents are saying, I think their future might be worse. You know, this might be a dimmer future than what I had. And that's a really scary thought. And I think that honestly, I mean, my personal opinion is I think growing up really Growing up as like Gen Z or even early millennials, I think you're dealing with, you know, September 11th, you're dealing with um, a huge financial crisis, you're dealing with the climate crisis, and these things are just punctuating your life and permeating permeating your life. It's impossible to separate these global events from your day-to-day existence, and you're kind of frustrated with the way that older generations are handling it. And I think something that I've heard often when I've talked to Um, older people about some of these issues is they'll say, oh, well, children are our future. You know, they will solve these problems. But that's, and and I appreciate that sentiment. That's a lot of pressure. And it's also like, well, why can't, you know, you, the older people who are in power, why can't you, you know, work on these problems now? Sorry, I totally, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, that's, you know, that's like what Greta said at the UN in that incredible speech. She was like, Thank you for giving us, uh, for saying like the children are going to save the future. But if it isn't clear, like I can't even fucking vote yet, like right. much less be in office, like do your job. No, do exactly. Your job. Exactly. Exactly. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, and I think that, you know, young people just feel that pressure all the time. Um, and I think that they've done an incredible job of, of kind of actively and proactively using those emotions of frustration in a really positive way. I mean, just, you just look at, the way that climate change activists, the way that police brutality activists are pushing the needle and really raising people's awareness in a way that we haven't seen before, you know, creating these sea changes. But the fact that they're having to do that at 12, at 14, at 16, that's, it's a little bit unfair. I think it's amazing that, you know, that that's happening, but it's just, it's a lot for them to bear. And then what we're seeing is that, you know, that generation and all of us, right? We're we're mentally stressed. We're feeling this mental toll. We've seen these kind of astronomically high rates of depression, of anxiety, of suicide. 
And there's debate of, you know, are these things actually happening at a higher prevalence or are we just talking about it more and diagnosing it more? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it is true that these things are prevalent, you know, just like we get sick physically, we get sick mentally and these issues need to be addressed. And I think that like ultimately the solutions are complex. Um, There's no kind of perfect magical cure for any of this. I think that as you mentioned, helping people feel like they're not alone in this is huge. You know, social connection is connected to longevity and positive mental health outcomes. Um, We have amazing ways of treating, amazing medications to treat this. We have experimental treatments that are coming out that are showing enormous promise, but it's a lifelong, I don't want, I don't know if I want to say struggle, but it's a lifelong issue. Um, And keeping your mental health Um, keeping, staying mentally strong and mentally healthy is something that you work on every day. And I think that the the best positive, and I think the thing that young people have done in the best way is they're talking about it more than ever. They're not pushing it to the side um, because none of these things are new. You know, older generations may have felt this way, but just dealt with it on their own, sucked it up and moved on. Right. Right. It's, um, not the, it's it, like you said. It's not all to say that like there haven't been um, crises before. Mm-hmm. But cer- certainly have. Uh, you know that's that's what you know. World War Two was all about. Um, you know, and and World War One before that, and, and in a million different ways. Or if you're uh, black for four hundred years, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's the there's the great funny but incredibly dark quote from our, our friend Rihanna Gunn Wright when she was being interviewed by Dr. Anna Elizabeth Johnson uh, last year about, you know, when did saving, when did your job become, you know, saving the apocalypse? And, and Rihanna Gunn Wright said something to the effect of like, I'm black, which, which apocalypse are we talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, and, absolutely. and so, so I can, you know, say uh, again, caveat all of this coming from my comfortable chair, uh, white middle-class straight male, um, who puts food on the table. It's, 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 it's inc- incredibly relatively easy for me to talk about these things. Um, and, and even I'm, and, and Brian who claims to still be 36, uh, don't, won't have the same future as these kids as much as we try to identify with them. There's a reason, you know, sun, sunrise or whatever, uh, only works with people under 40 or, or run for something, uh, you know, it's cause they're like, these people have a unique vantage point that no one else has ever had and and probably will ever have. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just like... But I, on the flip side, I do think it's important to stress that, um, you know, the world that young people are facing might look um, somewhat apocalyptic and scary, but it also might be more inclusive and sure. more connected than ever. You know, I mean, I don't know. I have a lot of um, faith in both like my generation, your generation, the ones coming after us. Um, of just tolerance and open-mindedness. Like I think that there, yeah. when it comes to social issues, like we're making huge progress and that's something to be incredibly excited about. And there are ways that we can still avoid worst case scenario when it comes to the climate and even these mammoth issues like the police system and reforming the police system or the justice system. Like we, those things are really overwhelming. Um, and I think oftentimes sure. thinking about them is incredibly paralyzing but it also, there are things that we can do, you know, we're not helpless in this situation. And so, and I think that young people realize that, you know, and that's why they're able to be so proactive and imagine a a different world. Well, and and that's why I I feel like the word, I I try to use like the, you know, think about like the word possibility as a word to the, as as opposed to like the word hope, because it feels a little more uh, pragmatic now, Mm -hmm. which is, and and this is how I, I also feel personally, which is like, and again, I, I don't want to get, you're a journalist, so I know you try to keep it to the straight and narrow, so I don't want to get too, too, too political on, on this specific conversation, but there, but again, it's like, you know, we, we ran a couple little Facebook ads and they got flagged as being political and I was like, no, it's science and that shouldn't be. Mm, um, mm-hmm. but, but the, my, my, my point is as far as like a sense of possibility. And like you said, because there are these incredible inclusive things happening that aren't perfect, but are so much better than they've ever been, mm-hmm. uh, sociologically, uh, I, I look at like, good God, if, if, if the people who are, let me put this way, the people who, who seem to be the most on the side of, uh, inclusivity and, and progress and a cleaner future and a healthier future and, and better jobs and, and, and all of these things, if they are able to actually be in power in this, in this sort yeah, of exactly, exactly. incredible transition moment, 
Like, the, I, and this is what I try to tell people when they're like, oh, you've run a sad podcast about climate change. I'm like, no, that's not it. Like, the the things that could the things that could be signed into law on like January 5th or whatever it is will change the world forever. Mm -hmm. And, and like, that is, that is like the thing that keeps me going every day is being like, there is a thing, there is a world that is within grasp that is like mind blowing Mm -hmm. and it, it could turn this ship around so fast. There's things that like we can't reverse to be very clear. And we talk about that all the time. There's a lot of climate stuff that's baked in clearly the world's on fire. Yep. Um, you know, California will continue to burn if we turn off emissions tomorrow for a long time. But I mean, there are things there, there is a possibility and a multitude of possibilities under the umbrella that, that are so close if we can do the thing. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I do agree with you. Um, I just, I, I, it's like, we, we just try to, you know, again, like it's it, the, the most important question in marriage is like, how can I help? And that's what we're trying to do to like these, these young people is like, just be allies wherever we can. Like, how, how can I help? Right. Um, Tr- transitioning just a little bit, Ali, you wrote a piece back in January, which again feels <laughs> like a different lifetime mm-hmm. about how uh, wildfire firefighters were burning out, mm-hmm. which looking outside our windows in, in September feels just ironically brutal. Um, and again, I, I want to be clear because, you know, we have a good portion of our listeners are, are abroad. Uh, these fires, uh, what's happening are not specific, uh, isolated to California or the no. West Coast of America, mm-hmm. uh, si- Siberia and South America, um, just these massive fires in areas w- where they've traditionally always happened, but not where people used to live, where they live now. Um, and, and now we're kind of fucked on a few of these things for a few reasons. Um, so I, I just, I wonder eight months after you wrote that piece about them being burnt out, like what still rings true to you about what you learned and, and, mm-hmm. uh, w- what's new there. And I guess what's the, what's the path forward to again, like be allies to these people who are quite literally on the front lines yeah. of the future here. Yeah. I mean, this story was probably one of my favorite um, and one of the most difficult stories I've ever written. Um, and it came about because I was trained as an EMT probably four or five years ago now. And one of my friends was a wildland firefighter. And, you know, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. We don't really get many wildfires out here, but I was talking to him about his job And he was just telling me about these really horrific um, instances, both in the landscape and when he was just responding to kind of house calls of things that, you know, are are the worst, most traumatic events that you are are kind of beyond comprehension. And this is, you know, a 21-year-old guy who's dealing with this on a bi-monthly basis. Um, with very limited support. You know, they they maybe said, okay, here's a hotline you can call. Um, but there was rarely talk about how um, experiencing these acute traumatic events, um, you know, really can hijack your mental health in a way that lasts sure. long after you get back from the fire. So I got inter- interested in it because of him. And then I was able to talk with the most amazing first responders um, and part of a community that honestly doesn't really like to talk about mental health, um, doesn't really like outsiders in the first place. And hearing their stories was really amazing and really difficult. I mean, one of the fire chiefs was telling me um, about a car crash that he responded to, or sorry, not a car crash, um, where uh, it w- but it was around a car on a highway. A father had lit his child on fire, a six-year-old, and the child had been burned all the way down to his socks. And when the firefighters got there, you know, this child was crying and crying out for help and just asked to be picked up and held. But the firefighters, including this fire chief, knew that they couldn't hold him because it would contaminate his wounds. So they had to, you know, wrap him in a blanket and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to get you help. And then this child ended up passing away just days later in the hospital. And that, you know, while is definitely not the typical call for a firefighter, like these events happen. And nearly every firefighter I spoke to had, you know, a dozen or so experiences similar or, um, you know, similarly traumatic. But yet these guys are and these women are just expected to um, kind of pack it in to be strong. You know, people it's a job you signed up for, right? Exactly. Exactly. There is a, there oh. is not a culture of weakness. Um, and, and so, yeah, so then they're carrying, you know, they're dealing with all this turmoil in their mind and then they're going out, um, and responding to these, to these fires that are getting bigger, more intense, more uncontrollable. 
every week. Um, and honestly, I think that again, like, like all these issues with mental health, like the path forward isn't necessarily clear, but there is really positive movement. Um, and I think like the first step of all of it is for people to realize that having these emotions, um, you know, having trouble processing an event like that is incredibly humid. And the, the fact that you are a first responder doesn't make you immune to the mental health toll that seeing that will take. And I think starting those discussions and then, you know, in, incorporating therapists and different health professionals and counselors into these units so that people realize, okay, this is a normal thing in the way that if I was injured, on a call, you know, I broke my ankle, I tore, you know, tore out my shoulder, I could go to the hospital and be treated. You know, if I'm dealing with something that has a similar damage to my mind, I can also be treated um, and kind of normalizing that experience. Yeah. I mean, again, it's like, it, it, you know, it, it's not, not dissimilar truly what these guys are facing on trauma and, and, and life-threatening wise as, as, as the military, um, which is like, yeah, it's, it's, yes, they, they signed up for it, but that doesn't excuse us from taking care of them in, in yeah. any way. Like it, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in Virginia right now and, and, uh, grew up half my, cl I'm in Williamsburg, which is, you know, 30 minutes from Fort Eustis, uh, an hour from the largest naval base on the planet, you know, all these things. And so my classes, like half of them would in elementary school would turn over every two years because people will get shipped one way or new one, people will come in. And, um, I, you know, one of my best friends is a submarine captain and, and all of these things. And, um, and you just go, I, I don't understand how, how, how we haven't, like, you look at the issues with like the VA mm -hmm. and you go, it, it's like the whole make America great again thing. It's going like, those people shouldn't just be getting, we shouldn't just be getting the VA back to neutral. It is mind boggling to me. They don't have like sci-fi level healthcare. Well, right. You know, like, yeah. and, and, and the same with these firefighters going like the things that we are, we, we are tasking them to do and asking them to do. It is uh, incomprehensible to me that, that we aren't giving them literally the greatest support we could imagine mm -hmm. um, so that they continue doing it, but also to, to, for the sunk cost of, of what they've, what they've, uh, done. It just seems in, imperative on society to do that. No, absolutely. But it's it's interesting because something that I came across when I was doing this reporting was that people they it's very comforting to people to and just the public to imagine that there are these invincible superheroes out there who are able to take all of these things on physically and mentally and never take a break. You know, never, yeah. never experience the the awful side effects that can come with it and we want to imagine that, that person exists but that person doesn't exist you know we are all human and anyone any person put in this position is going to feel the weight of it and sure. and like you you know i was shocked to find that and it obviously it it varies you know fire department to fire department but across generally speaking across um the wildland fire community you know the resources just aren't there there's limited funding. And there's just, I think, limited, it, people are scared to talk about it. But what we're seeing is that, you know, rates of suicide, rates of PTSD, rates of substance abuse are astronomical within that community um, in a way that some of which is preventable. And like, we should be, we should be freaking out and trying to help these people as, as fast as we can. But it's also a problem because a lot of people just don't realize that it's even going on in the first place. Um, and that was kind of what I hope to do with this article was start that conversation and even make people who are, you know, living in New York City understand what it's like to fight fires in Oregon. Yeah. I mean, again, if the entire East Coast was on fire, the news cycle would be very different. I mean, thanks to the New York Times for putting it on the front page today. But, you know, it's it's uh it's um and I don't have like a West Coast bias. I've lived there for eleven years. There's pros and cons to both, but it's it's um it's it's, it's, it's crazy. It's the same way, you know, again, we've forgotten about what happened to Louisiana ag again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's complicated, much. but these people on the front lines, like you said, they're not some specific breed of human that can weather this better. I mean, I think on just a microcosm level, my sister-in-law for, for like 10 years, um, she's a social worker and she did hospice care mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that was her life every day. And I was like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. How? How do you know that that's what your day is going to be and not just be, not just drink heavily when you're done at the end of every day? 
And it wasn't that uh, she's a better person. I mean, she's a much better person than I am, um, <laughs> but, but that's a different discussion. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't affect her. Yeah. But at the same time, like we have to su- support those, those, that apparatus uh, that's so necessary in our society um, just vastly more than we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Also, guy, listen, I've read comic books and watched a lot of, Shows and movies, See, superheroes also take breaks. So if anybody's sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. like everybody needs to to chill sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Ali, we'll get into um, some like everyday actions that that people can be taking um, for sure here. But uh, let's talk a little bit about what's what's coming down the line. I would like to talk about magic mushrooms. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe we could. Maybe we could start by just. Can you just tell people like what what psilocybin is and, mm-hmm. and why why it's sort of I don't know like suddenly seeming to get so much play. Yeah. So psilocybin is the active psilocybin. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Psilocybin is the active psychoactive compound in magic mushrooms. Um, and this it kind of comes along with this whole renaissance around psychedelic research. If you've read. Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. You might have heard about it, but there's been... So good. So good, yeah. There's been just this recent upswell in studying psychedelics like LSD, like MDMA, like psilocybin, um, for mental health, for for alcohol use disorder, um, for depression, for a lot of different um, kind of issues that that are really pressing and, and oftentimes don't have great existing treatments. And all this comes because in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of psychedelic research and really promising findings that showed that a single treatment, um, you know, with a licensed therapist could help relieve these mental health symptoms. But then when the war on drugs happened, um, these drugs got, got, they were classified as illegal schedule one drugs, which took them out of the realm of clinical research. They were widely stigmatized. There were a lot of kind of urban legends that, if you were to take one of these drugs, you would go insane, you would lose your mind, um, you'd have these uncontrollable experiences. And some of those, you know, legends are rooted in reality. They are, these are powerful drugs. Um, I think no researcher or doctor I've ever spoken to has ever said, okay, yeah, we recommend people to go out and try it on their own. Like <laughs> right. that is not something they're saying because it can induce serious feelings of anxiety. And in people who have a history of psychosis, it can also kind of trigger some of those symptoms. So it's not a risk-free drug. But in the past 15 years, there have been these amazing researchers who've worked so hard at an uphill battle to try and see if these psychedelics can have meaningful effects on our mental health. And they've shown some pretty incredible results. I specifically wrote about um, how psilocybin is helping cancer patients And this is interesting because, I mean, I'm sure you guys have had loved ones or friends who've dealt with cancer. You know, that is one of the most feared diagnoses in medicine that just can put you into a pit of depression and anxiety, feeling hopeless about the future, feeling like you're dead already. You know, there's cancer patients deal with a huge amount of mental stress on top of kind of the physical symptoms that they deal with from the cancer and then from the treatment. But antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication doesn't work well for this patient population. Um, And so they're kind of just left in the lurch and they don't have many ways to alleviate these feelings. So these researchers, um, primarily at UCLA, NYU Langone and Johns Hopkins, they have been testing psilocybin with this patient population and found that, you know, in a very controlled, careful setting, when it's paired with um, psychotherapy, it's actually an incredibly fast-acting, long-lasting treatment um, for the mental health effects of cancer. And these, what they've seen in like the longest study to date is that these, the positive effects, so making anxiety and depression essentially go away, um, that's lasted for five years after a single dose treatment. And so, you know, Jesus. we do need to take this with a grain of salt because we haven't done kind of these larger scale phase three trials um, there have been kind of early preliminary studies, but what the researchers say is that the signal is incredibly strong and that psychedelics are going to transform the way that we treat so many mental health conditions um, and really be like a massive game changer in the field. Just like the most interesting thing ever to me. Yeah. I'm so curious about it. Yeah. Yeah, this this thing that is so, so, so prevalent because we look in... Uh, we, for, 
everyone now lives in such a combustible, conflicted, tor- tormented world in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and, and especially again, these frontline people, or like you said, people who have have PTSD or people who get um, a cancer diagnosis. It, it's it, we've effectively been seemingly again like there's still so much research to be done but it seems like we may have been this entire time playing this game of helping them with one hand tied behind our back yeah um and and again it requires you know tons and tons and tons more research i i think everyone is uh, at this point again like everyone's an epidemiologist everyone knows what phase three trials means <laughs> right, uh right. they are very important right now and it's guess what those apply to all of science not just a, the vaccine that you're hoping to give your kids so you can go back to school no, um, absolutely. it's it's um it's everything and 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 getting to phase three by the way uh doesn't happen for most 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 uh, things are trying to be rolled out, whether it's a vaccine or a treatment or something like that. Most things fail along the way. They're mm-hmm. looking for them to fail so they can find out uh, all the its process of elimination, what doesn't work. And getting to phase three is much wider and is and is very important, but it's going to require just massive restructuring from 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 the government and the FDA and places like that. And again, one of those things that should should certain elections go certain ways. Um, th- there is hope. There's possibility to really light a fire under these things, mm-hmm. um, but also, you know, again, and we'll, we'll we will say this again, folks. Uh, don't run out and just do these things. They really, oh my gosh, yeah, they, no, first please all, don't. <laughs> they, they, first of all, one, they are classified as level one. Like you'll go to fucking jail. And second of all, um, I mean, there's places all over the world you can do it. But don't. Um, but also, they really, 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 really require supervision um, from people who who know what they're what they're doing with this. Mm-hmm. Um, so. But it is it it is incredible. All right, fine. You know, um, <laughs> put put it away, Brian. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is amazing, and like you said, I mean, for for cancer, I mean, just yeah, we've we've all had things like that. When my best friend died of cancer ten years ago. Like I, I can't imagine as he. I remember the day I got the he 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 got diagnosed, and three months later it was gone. And and I remember um, the day a week about a week before he died, when his his uh, new wife emailed my brother and I and said, um, Hey guys, you know, deep breath. We're going to, uh, we're going to go home mm-hmm. and what something like this could have, could have helped him for mm-hmm. that week mm-hmm. as he, as he faced what was then inevitable. And, and there's people every day. One of uh, my, my favorite places to work with in, in the whole world is Alex's lemonade stand, which is an incredible foundation supporting pediatric cancer research and travel funds for uh, families uh, that are facing cancer in one way or another. Uh, it's run by Liz and Jay Scott. Their daughter Alex died when she was eight or nine years old, twenty years ago now, and uh, it's just this incredible foundation. And again, you just think like, uh, look, look there. Not to say anybody deserves it, but there's people get you get cancer because you. My dad has skin cancer because he was a Jersey lifeguard and didn't wear sunscreen for mm. fifteen years. You know, or smokers. Like one plus one equals two sometimes, but a lot of these people, and especially kids, do not deserve this and and got it from some terrible environmental thing we've done or who knows what. Um, but, but even a, the adults, like w- what something like this could do for them again, coming back to hospice care, mm-hmm. h- how, how that could help them and, and free them is just, it seems just silly and, and yeah. so short sighted that we wouldn't explore these. Maybe they don't work out, but why right. wouldn't we, why wouldn't we yeah, why not? explore right. the science of these things as much as we can? Yeah. Well, and I think you noted something really important, which is that for this particular group, you know, these are people with advanced cancer. Uh, Some of them are terminally ill, you know, death is imminent. Um, And for those people, you know, the risk calculation is a bit different, at least according to the, you know, the doctors and the researchers doing this. Um, they, They don't have many options. Maybe they've tried antidepressants. They've gone to therapy. They've done everything, but they're literally staring death in the face. Um, and if you can have this treatment or this therapy that shows, you know, tremendous, tremendous safety, number one, you know, they've seen very limited adverse events in when it's mm-hmm. done in this very controlled setting. Um, and also just amazing, almost instantaneous transformations. I mean, I spoke with cancer patients who had gone through some of the clinical trials and they described um, literally seeing their fear related to their cancer as a black mass and then yelling at it and saying, why the fuck are you here? Get out of my body. And the fear dissipated and never returned. And obviously that's not going to be the case for every patient. That was, you know, that particular patient's experience, but they've seen 
just really stunning effects. And, you know, one psychologist put it to me that in psychiatry and psychology, you know, people work with their therapists for years to make some of these breakthroughs. These are the breakthroughs that, you know, counselors wish for and hope for their patients. And this kind of treatment can speed that up. Um, and, you know, you can have those breakthroughs in a single day um, that you might work on for years. And so it's really promising. I think it should give people a lot of hope. Again, this all needs to be te- tempered with like, we need the large scale data to say for sure that this works. And this isn't for everybody. You know, this isn't for everyone who's dealing with anxiety or depression. It might be for particular groups, but it is really hopeful. And it's it's really amazing that science is moving so rapidly to address these issues that just are really overwhelming um, and taxing. And also for the cancer patients, it makes them have worsened outcomes from the cancer and, you know, high risk of suicide and all of that. Like this is a particular patient population that the researchers say is perfect for this treatment, but it's a matter, you know, they're just going to have to wait until these um, trials are completed, which could take years, you know, if not a decade. Wow. And, and that's the story of science, right? It's, um, I mean, think all the people, and, and the, the biggest difference between World War One and World War Two is uh, penicillin, right? You know, it's um, like the things that, that that could have been that could have helped people. And I think back to my friend and like the 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 strides, the uncertain, but but very promising strides we're making with things like Im- immunology, like would that have helped my friend 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. But may, maybe, or maybe not at all, but based on how it's going. Um, but the point is, is like, you know, there's always this sense of like what, what could have been and and it's very hard to tell people uh, now that have cancer, there's terminal people today. Um, hey, listen, these things, uh, they might be regulated uh, better in, in in two years or five years or 10 years or not at all. And they can't wait for it. But at the same time, um, we have to keep pushing on from that because uh, we are going to need an exponential number of extreme tools like this as, as we push forward. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. On top of all the... Amazing, you know, day-to-day things that 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 we'll talk about here in one sec. But we, we're just going to need more of these, and we need every tool we can uh, we can possibly get our hands on. Mm-hmm. And psychedelics are not the only thing you know scientists are working on. They're making breakthroughs yeah, around this every day. And so, while science, I think, can move, I remember I interviewed um, uh, Wim Hof, which is he is a um, oh almost yeah. like a guru. Yeah, he's he's founder of the Wim Hof method. And he was talking about how he was, you know, really frustrated that science wasn't moving faster um, to prove the benefits of his purported therapy. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, science is as fast as a slow turtle. And he's right in a lot of ways. And there are reasons for that. You know, we want if we're having a drug on the market, if we're um, if doctors are advising patients with a certain treatment, like we want to know it works and we know want to know it's safe and that um, it's helpful. Um, and that we're not just kind of, um, you know, throwing out shots in the dark. And that's a reason we have a really rigorous drug approval process. And that's a wonderful thing. Like, I think everyone should feel really thankful and comforted by that. But then there are certain things, um, science can move really fast, you know, and like what we've discovered in the past two decades about the brain and brain function and neuroscience is incredible. So it's, it's kind of this push pull, but I think that's what, that's like the best part of my job is I get to hear from scientists who are moving just in an incredible pace to solve some of these, you know, kind of intractable problems that seem impossible and bringing them into reality possibly faster than people can even, you know, imagine. Yeah. And I, I, I urge folks as much as possible. Again, there's some incredible futuristic things uh, coming down the pipe, some rough stuff and some truly amazing stuff. The things that you know, some of these cancer researchers tell us they're doing with zebrafish. I, I have yet yeah. to begin to understand oh, how this yeah. works, but it's going to be fucking awesome. Um, Wild. But uh, as with uh, all of these vaccines and everyone refreshing the New York Times vaccine counter and, and this and that, uh, I, I urge you to understand that science is very, very, very hard. And, um, you know, it, it takes, whether we're shooting rockets to space or we're or, we're trying to help out kids or, 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 or you know, find some sort of treatment for, for COVID. It's very difficult. And the smartest people on the entire planet are all working together on these things. Um, and, and they're doing the best we can. And so, um, look out for those things, find it from reputable places, but also, um, as we're going to get into in a second and Brian will lead us into, there's some really wonderful things you can be doing today to take care of yourself and your loved ones and and all these people on the front line. So, so Brian, uh, 
Curious for Hey, let's let's get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we always like to uh get action steps involved here um, because that's the whole point of this thing. And usually we ask our listeners to uh, uh, talk about using their voice and their vote and their dollar. But maybe today we could pivot and um, we can, so so that they can focus on on themselves uh, first. So Allie, where do you feel like uh, people can start to find some help knowing that they can, they can only control so much outside of, of their own headspace? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's great to read about or hear about these amazing future developments, but um, there's a lot you can do while we wait. Um, And those things are not miracle cures. Like as we talked about, there's no magic bullet when it comes to health for your mind or your body. But I think there are like some, some great habits people can put into place every day. And I think the first, especially now, is just giving yourself a break. I think we put so much pressure on ourselves, especially when we're dealing with overwhelming emotions, whether it's anger, whether it's depression, we don't, those, those feelings make us uncomfortable. And a lot of times we just push them down. We try to move on. We try to distract ourselves, but I think that's me. Yeah. I think giving, giving yourself a break to feel that, to let it wash over you, um, is really a great way to move forward because I think obviously we know emotions don't last forever. Every emotion is momentary, um, and it will eventually pass. That's all to say there are very real mental health issues that are lasting and they can feel like they're never going to end. And, you know, that's where checking in with friends, staying connected with loved ones, going to see a therapist, if that's possible for you, those things can be really helpful. And I think something that I focus on a lot is the relationship between the body and mind and the way that, you know, exercise and working out and sweating um, on a regular basis obviously is helpful, um, you know, as we age to stay healthy, to stave off illness, but it is absolutely helpful in protecting our mental health. Um, You've written about that. I've written about it a lot. It's it's science. It is science. Yeah. I mean, exercise actually can improve the brain's resilience to stress. Um, You know, it can help you deal with depression. It can help you deal with anxiety And even from just like, if you're feeling totally overwhelmed and you want to get outside, go for a run, that can help you kind of shake off those worries. Um, But it also can help modulate um, like your brain function, increase blood flow, um, do all these great things. Um, So I think keeping that in mind on a day-to-day basis is crucial. I think as we talked about, you know, giving yourself um, or intentionally consuming the news, giving yourself a break from that and from your phone, um, practicing gratitude. And some people love journaling. I've never been, even though I'm, I write every day, journaling is not <laughs> my thing. Meditation is hugely helpful. You know, just giving your brain the chance to reset and heal itself. Because when you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off every day, you don't get that chance to reset and eventually you will kind of crash. So what you want to do is create these sustainable habits every day to give yourself a break and to move forward in a way that helps you feel strong and, um, and positive about your life and healthy. I love that. Love that. Needed to hear that. (laughs) Yeah. Check. Thank you. Uh, Uh how much do I owe you for the session? Um, (laughs) talk to me about what friends, and, and loved ones can do for one another. Uh, cause sometimes it, as, as someone who's been on both sides of this, it can be hard to hear those things. Mm-hmm. Um, not, 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 maybe not hard to, what's the best way to put it? Maybe not hard to hear them, but, uh, you know, it's very easy to give the response. And again, having been on both sides to give the response and get the response of, yeah, 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 I know. Uh, yeah, I'll do, I'll, yeah, I'm going to do it. I, I know I've been thinking about it. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. And, it That's what I ha- say. and it doesn't happen. Brian, you literally said that half an hour ago. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> what What do you find? What What do you feel like are some effective ways that again, everyone's dealing with so many different things on so many different levels. There are some things that uh, unite all of us these days, but things that you feel like uh, translate to to give help. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really difficult, and I think it's we often forget how hard it is to watch a loved one dealing with mental health issues. Um, It can make you feel totally helpless. And like we mentioned before, telling that person to just think positive or calm down or um, kind of rationalize your way out of those feelings, it doesn't work. Um, And it's it's not necessarily the, the best way to support that person, according to psychologists. I think part of 
what I've seen effective, both in some of the research that I've covered and also in my own life, is connecting the person who's struggling with the fact that you are dealing with your own stuff too, you know, that you're not coming from a place of pity or that you think what they're going through is like so, so troubling or so pressing. Um, but that, you know, these are normal human emotions that we all feel with, to, we feel at different degrees. Um, so I think sharing your personal experience can, and what helps you, I think helps everyone. So you could maybe, you know, offer to go on a walk with this person and say like, yeah, I've really, um, you know, I've started playing tennis. I started learning a new hobby. Um, that's really helped me kind of shake off this funk. Or even if it's someone who's dealing with um, more severe um, pressures on their mental health, you know, sharing, oh, well, I went to a therapist and it was really helpful for me. I think it's important to remember, like, there's no formula for any of this. Um, and all of the solutions and tools and strategies that we can employ, they're all personal. And I think a lot of times it's just trying them out trying them out and seeing how you feel doing them. And what's going to be right for one person is not going to be right for another, but sharing kind of the options out there, um, maybe even offering to, to go do that activity or go see that therapist, you know, take them to the therapist, um, offer that support, I think is really helpful. I think that, you know, across the board, and this is just a basic human need, is that we don't want to feel alone when we're navigating life. And especially when you're dealing with some of these issues, it can feel really stigmatizing and you can feel like something's wrong with you as an individual or that you're the only person on the planet um, feeling this way. And, you know, we know that that's not true, um, that we all go through, go through these periods in life. So kind of cultivating that empathy and connection and showing that person, like, I'm here with you every step of the way is hugely helpful for people. Um, well, you might just be the best human we know, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that think is, that's uh, pretty awesome. I appreciate that. That's nice of you to say. You are like, the one woman Avengers of um, of of objective uh, helping people to to live better lives and make this a better place. So thanks. Um, this has yeah. been ver- really tremendous, uh, Brian. Brian, take us take us home. Yeah, we've wow, really kept you here. Hope that you're uh, that you're doing all right over there, Allie. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Yeah. No, this has been great. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, seriously, thank you so much for for this. This is incredible, uh, truly. And and we just have um, uh, just a a little lightning round of, to to wrap things it's up. Not, if that's all right, it's not a lightning round. Lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> we Sounds good. We, we, we're this to be clear. This is episode ninety nine, and we haven't figured out how exactly yeah. to frame this one. Anyways. Allie, when was the first time in your life uh, when you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? Oh, my gosh. Don't know that I can pin down um, the first time because my brain is mush right now. But I think a time in recent memory where I really felt like I was able to make some kind of difference and had some power to move the needle was actually when the story about wildland firefighters was published. And Mm. I remember I was so nervous to put this out Um, Because these amazing first responders had given me, you know, just a ton of time and they'd been so vulnerable vulnerable about things that had happened to them that they had never really shared with anyone. And I was about to put it out into the world. And I remember that morning I started getting messages um, from some of the people I had interviewed and they were just honestly blown away that it started conversations within that community. You know, they were talking about... um, some of the things they were dealing with and ways to make it better. Um, and now there have been, you know, policy changes and program programmatic changes that have spurred from that. And so it was suddenly I was like, OK, I, I wrote this story. And sometimes you send these things out into the ether and you have no idea what's going to come of them. But hearing sure. that, you know, people reading it suddenly, they were able to empathize and understand what these people were going through was like massively validating. And it just pushed me to do more work like that. Right. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's the it, it. It moved the needle, and anything that moves the needle these days has um, is necessary and has just got to feel redeeming. I recently set up a. Um, this is not that. This is the, the most ridiculous side story ever. But I have this ridiculous, powerful to do list sort of system uh, that makes me very productive, but also can make it feel like I have ten thousand things to do. But I finally, uh, per my therapist recommendation, set up a little perspective that that with a click of a button shows me what I've actually done today. And that is really helpful to looking back and going like, oh no, I I did things that 
that hopefully help the world and move the needle today. Like this is what I accomplished, not just these are the 30 things I didn't get to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and that's a terrible way to relate to your incredible story about the <laughs> human, about no, but the that's humanity. Your, that's your thing. That's really, that's actually super important for you. So that's awesome. That's very kind and sarcastic of you, Brian. No, no. It. You have the largest to-do list I've ever seen. And yeah, do you ever look at your done list? That's so great. Your therapist is smart. <sighs> He's good. Uh, Ali, <laughs> who is someone in your... You can be done with us very soon, I promise. Who is someone <laughs> in your life that's positively impacted your work in the past six months? Ah, um, I mm-hmm. would have to say my editor, Sarah. She is someone who is incredibly supportive, you know, will be there with you in the middle of um, a breakdown and on your highest day. Um, And, you know, she has extremely high expectations. She's extremely detail oriented. She's always making stories better. Um, But she's also always trying to get to the heart of the story and the people who are affected. Um, And I think that's the best part about this job. You know, I'm not here to kind of spin facts into something that is not real or, um, you know, the whole point of my job is to kind of amplify um, people's experiences that might be overlooked. Um, And Sarah helps me put that at the center of everything I do in every single story and never lose sight of that because it can be hard, you know, when you're dealing with three hour deadlines or you're covering some breaking news and you're just trying to get the story out. But she always reminds me, okay, who is this? Who is this story for and who does this story affect? Oh, those are such great questions. Oh yeah. man, that's really wow. great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Love that. Um, and you said her name was Sarah, is that Sarah right? Sarah Sloat, mind and body editor at Inverse. Well, thank you, Sarah. Editors yeah, are, are undervalued in on this planet. Um Ali, we've you've you've given us a lot of and our listeners a lot of options uh, as to, as uh, things they can do to take care of themselves and and practice sort of self care in these overwhelming times. What do you, what do you specifically do to practice self care? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I'm still learning. Um, oh yeah, aren't we all? I love to run, so oftentimes, honestly, when I'm just feeling like totally at my wits end, just fraying at the edges. I go on a long run, um, you know, and that just helps me. Like, I think it's something about grounding in your body, um, getting out of your head. That's something that's really, really helpful. Cause I think that I'm sure you guys feel this too. It's easy to always be thinking and overthinking and predicting the future and figuring out what you're going to do tomorrow. And sometimes you just don't need to think at all. Um, and I think that like working out hard, can help you do that. So I try and do that, but it's also difficult because, you know, when you're feeling really overwhelmed, the last thing you want to do is work out. So it's kind of like muscling yourself through that and, and making yourself do it even when you don't want to. Yeah. Big time. Um, I want to, I want to eat donuts when I'm stressed out. Brian, (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, why does everything Ali say feel so, so grounded and, and, and like, it makes sense where, yeah, where you and I were like, I don't know, let's go eat the ice cream flight at uh, the, the ice cream <laughs> store. And maybe that'll make us feel better. It doesn't. It's science, but we did no. it anyways. <laughs> no, I mean, you uh. need to do that too sometimes too. There's no like, yeah, whatever makes you feel better and feel good. Like that's what you should do. Yeah. 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 True. Yeah. Um, all right, Brian. Uh, yeah. We, Allie, we used to ask this really specific final question. And I, well, I guess, so, all right. So we used to ask if you could, if you could send one book to Donald Trump, what oh would it be? Oh my gosh! And, yeah, uh, we've gotten some awesome answers from from all of our past guests, uh, and they're all on Bookshop. We can all all look them up and and even send them uh, to him if we want. Um, but maybe we can start moving on uh, moving on from that uh, framing today because I don't think he's getting the message. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> so maybe instead, is there what's a book that you've read? you know, this year or so that has opened your mind to a to top uh, a new topic maybe that you hadn't considered before or or that's changed your your thinking in some way? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that I recently read um Yvon Chouinard's book, Let My People Go Surfing. Oh, um so which I know we like hold up. It's so good. But I we hold up Patagonia as kind of like this pinnacle of corporate social responsibility. And I think initially, honestly, when I opened the book, I was a little skeptical. I was like, is this too good to be true? And I think that, you know, obviously no company is perfect by any means, but I really appreciated the level of intention and thoughtfulness that Patagonia has implemented in like every part of their supply chain. 
And it was really fascinating to know that, you know, a huge company like that doesn't have to be the bad guy, you know, doesn't have to leave behind this trail of horrific environmental waste and irrevocable damage. Like there is a better way. Um, And I think that he laid out, you know, just in incredible detail, sometimes a little boring, but most of the time really riveting, um, that there is a different way to conduct business. Um, And although I'm not in the business world, like I found it um, so interesting. And I also kind of changed my own consumption patterns about like, you know, what kind of companies do I want to support? What kind of clothing do I want to buy? And how that, you know, the long trail behind that um, is going to really shape the future. Like how we consume things is so crucial. And like thinking more intentionally about that is such a helpful helpful exercise for everybody. I love that one. Um, Awesome. That's a that's a really great recommendation, and yeah, it's it's just rare, and and again, no one's perfect, but it's rare from from when that book was written to to today to the things they're doing and they've done uh, to continually, especially so, uh, a company capitalism, <laughs> to yeah. to continue to be hold up that standard. You know, Yvonne's not even in charge anymore, um, and and to put and then to keep pushing it forward. Uh, mm-hmm. is, is, is God, it's, it's, it feels good and thank God and it's redeeming, but it's also a great standard to measure your own actions and self by to go like, boy, that can't be easy. Uh, cause clearly nobody else really does it. So, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I can sure as hell start measuring myself and, and my work in a way that that is similar. Great one. Great one for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Boom. Allie, where can our listeners follow you on the internet? They can find me on Twitter at Ali Patillo. Um, they can find me at Inverse under Ali Patillo. You can find me at Instagram under Ali Patillo. And I also have a website that is alexandrapatillo.com um, that has kind of highlights of my work so far that if people want to, you know, check out some, some interesting, I hope, stories, they can go there. Awesome. And yeah, we're going to link to all the articles yeah, that yeah. you wrote about and we talked about today and all those things. Uh, and studies and all that. So definitely dig into the show notes, folks. Allie, I mean, all in. This has been like four hours of your life. So uh, <laughs> I, I can't. I can't. No, it's been you great that. talking to you guys. Thank you so um, much for having me. Ditto. No, of course. Thank you for all your work. Um, be safe. Uh, travel safe. Um, and um, yeah, we'll we'll talk to you soon. I'm 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 excited about this fun fun little collaboration. Thank you to uh, Inverse and Abstract and Sarah for. Uh, for loaning us, Ali. Um, this has been truly fantastic. Thanks, guys. Talk really to you great. soon. Really needed. Thank All you right, so take much. Take care, Ali. Bye. Thanks to our incredible guest today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at important, not imp. Uh, just it's so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. 